Hey people, look, this video is a collection of thoughts, tips and tricks about how we can stay better concealed in the bush as we're stalking game and moving about through our forested environments. There's a lot of different factors that will go into developing a new hunter's ability to do this, but the main factor, I guess, is just taking one thing at a time and developing an intuition about it. So this video is gonna focus mainly on how we can minimize our sound in the bush and how we can minimize our visual profile. When it comes to the scent control side of things and how we work with the wind, that's gonna be a completely different video because there's just a lot to unpack there. But hey folks, look, I can only draw from my own experience. This is not gonna be some big complete lesson. It's just a lot of thoughts that can come to the top of my head, the things that I think about readily. So it's a conversation and there's always a comment section below if you want to share. But otherwise, maximum respect. Hope you get something out of this. Folks, this video is brought to you with the support of The Modern Hunter, who supply all the Maven optics to this channel. And if you're interested in some Mavens, please check out the link below. Look, you know, there's so many different factors that we can deal with here, but if we want to break it down into basics, we're trying to operate in the three senses, which is sight, smell, hearing, that's us avoiding being seen or heard or smelt by the game, but also trying to maximize our chance to see, hear, and often smell the game as well. So it's one of these situations that goes vice versa, and I always remember that. We're dealing with mammals that are sharing the same senses that we do, but their senses are often adverse to us. For example, pigs have an excellent sense of smell, and they've got good hearing, but they've got pretty rubbish eyesight. We've got very average smell compared to a lot of game. We've got much better eyesight a lot of the time and we have the assistance of good optics and the like to help us with that. But what I would like to emphasize to new hunters is yes, you're developing these skills and if there's a lot of things to think about, you can't think about all of those kind of things at once. So what I advocate is just trying to build instinct one technique at a time. Like if you're out in a hunt and you're like, well, I'm really not getting as close as I'd like to or I just seem to keep putting them up further away from shooting distance and the like, just take one thing and work on it and just see how that improves your success rate or how much you're closing the distance, how often you're seeing game on a hunt, that kind of thing. The first thing I'd like to kind of address is the sound thing. And you know, it's all about kind of minimizing sound and getting as quiet as humanly possible. I'll demonstrate to you the best technique to achieving that. doing nothing. Being absolutely still, absolutely quiet, not moving, not shifting. Um, you'll be seen less that way. But can we have a hunt where the whole thing's a sit and wait? Well, I guess it all depends on context. Like if you're in the United States and you've got five acres of land and you're in a tree stand, yeah, you are still and silent all day. From my experience in a lot of Aussie bush hunting, that is not a reasonable expectation. We're gonna to have to move and inevitably, we have to accept that we're gonna make sound at some stages. So being clever with this kind of thing, we can develop techniques to minimize as much sound as we move as possible, but we'd also like to try and find opportune moments where we can get away with making sound when we have to. But let's just start with a few little shift about techniques. I'll throw them to you now. One of the simplest things that we can do is just get in the habit of rolling your feet. It's placing the back of your heel down and then rolling into a step like that. So the reason this is effective is that rather than just taking a step like a full surface area all at once, which will produce more sound, we get the opportunity to do almost zero surface area to start off with. But if our back foot's flat, then we've got a stable position. And then it's a situation where you can slowly move through, spread that sense of sound out, rather than being a sound event in the bush that's noticeable. Now, of course, the second thing is just being very mindful about where we place our feet. And, you know, if you're in a forested environment, the terrain beneath you is going to be often very mixed. You can't just expect it all to be a nice green strip like this. <laughs> just the location I've chosen today. Um, particularly, you, know, you want to find deer in their bedding areas, you're going to be finding it amongst structure, amongst fallen sticks, rocks and the like. Um, but if your attention's always just down and like one step after the other, well then, you haven't split your attention enough to be, you know, detecting game as much as you are trying to be undetected yourself. In the same way as we're just talking about rolling your feet and the first movement being placing your heel 
an angle down on the ground like that before it rolls in. There's just zero surface area when you put an upside down triangle on the ground like that. The same can be if you find little rocks and the like in the other way, provided they're stable and you're looking for them. Placing a foot on top of a little rock point in amongst a bunch of leaf litter and debris like that is going to be a silent step. Little things like that. It can be as simple as also when you're just walking along you know, a trail or a path into your area, maybe choosing to walk on the side, on the grassy bit, rather than rocky gravel in the middle. Little things like that. One thing, of course, is just to be a very aware of what other sounds in the bush might be able to mask you going forward or might prevent you from being heard. Two classic examples, like let's start with wind. As soon as you've got wind in the air and there's that rustle, that's going to mask your crunch and your footsteps very effectively. But you're also going to expect when there's a bit of wind picking up is sometimes little twigs and branches are coming down. The sound of a, a twig breaking under your foot, we might think, oh, that's the moment where we're sprung, but it's actually a very natural noise in the bush. Animal and game expect to hear those kind of noises, but they'll expect to hear those kind of noises more often when there's a pickup in wind. It's just normal for them. And look, you know, that's a time when you know, a lot of animals know that they're a bit vulnerable because they can't hear and smell very easily when there's a bit of a, a swirl and a pickup. So they might go to ground, but that's still your key advantage point. Of course, another example could be you know, just flowing water in a creek or a river. And it can be a great advantage to be shifting along the side of a creek where game will often congregate at, you know, more often at different times of the year, but often more at the end of the day, you have to drink. There's often more moisture at the, the bottom of a valley or a gully, and that's where there's going to be the most feed. So it's an advantageous place to be stalking at certain times, but you're also having your sound masked by the sound of flowing water. Another little thing that I've noticed as well is that there'll be times of day like early morning and late in the evening when more animals generally are shifting around. They wait till that, you know, that last hour to come out and feed. So they're also expecting to hear, now this is a mix of maybe you know, deer pigs, but also uh, lots of native, like wallabies and kangaroos, all shifting to feed areas all at once. So they're expecting that pickup in sound. Now, they're also very wary at this time of day, so you've got to be very mindful, but you can sometimes get away with making a little bit of noise if they're on the hop or they're on the trot as well. I find myself trying to just break things into two phases. If I'm moving, I'm moving and if I stop moving I 100% stop and there's a lot of time when I'm stalking that I'm just absolutely not moving it's not just like shifting around me it's, it's absolutely 100% still so if I have to move I want to choose those opportune moments to move at times when weather and environmental factors can mask my noise as I shift but also simple things like if I've decided all right there's a tree 30 meters up that way and I need to get to it and I've picked my moment to get there, I'm picking up my stride. I'm going fast, and but also by having a broader stride, there's less actual footsteps, there's less impacts on the ground, and I'm also making sure that I get there reasonably swiftly because all that time spent getting from A to B is time when I'm not really actively listening and I'm vulnerable and exposed to being heard. And look, no, because I'm, I'm a genuine believer, it might be other people's experience, please share if, uh, if it is, but I can't actually actively listen properly unless I'm completely still. So I notice a lot of people, like their entire day in the bush will be all one really slow movement sneaking about, but just that movement and that focus on other things means that they cannot engage in active listening. But again, I'm always gonna advocate just trying to find points of time to be still and aware situational awareness, active listening as much as possible. And if I have to shift, I shift very deliberately. What I want to touch on now is how we best use natural structure in our environments to conceal ourselves. 90% of the public land that I actively hunt, whether it be New South Wales or Victoria, is a tree dense forested environment. Sure you get clearings, sure you get open high tops sometimes, all that kind of stuff. Simple radiata pine like this just offers the perfect concealment from a jump to jump point. If ever I'm just stopping to listen, I just want to anchor myself to structure. Whether it's being right next to it, shifting behind it, the point is 
this concealment can go for 360 degrees based on my need. You could have an animal walking straight over the top there and I could have my eye on it just out the side but constantly be shifting and staying very close to the tree. As soon as you're anchored to structure, you don't find yourself silhouetted. You don't find yourself standing out and caught in the open where you're trying to make a quick move. The other important thing that a tree can provide is just a really easy rest. And for me, it's just about getting the palm of the hand and a thumb out like that. Get it up and down, get the elevation right. Shift around like this, shift around. Because part of the whole situational awareness thing when you're out hunting is just to be on the periphery. And this is an instinct driven thing. This is something that will be developed for new hunters is that you're constantly just looking for a piece of structure, whether it be trees that are standing, a collection of trees that have fallen that might pr provide a natural hide and some real concealment for a longer period of time if you want to sit and wait, that kind of thing. But as you're looking ahead for game, if it's in the distance, also be looking for whatever's in between it so that if you can get close to structure, you can see what's going on in the distance fairly easily. But when they're looking your way, they're gonna see the structure first before they see you. And if it comes to a situation where you have to quickly conceal yourself, it might be half a step inwards behind the tree. You've still got a visual as you peer out the side, knock your binos over or something like that, or get your gun ready to quickly exploit the situation. I think you guys understand what I'm saying, but using the natural structure and tree hopping your way as you go along is a very efficient tactic and stops you from being caught out. Somewhere like this, with me crouched down, is going to offer a lot of cover, for sure. But if I'm going to react to a situation like shifting game, because those kind of situations change all the time, I get up. There's that many trip hazards and stuff in the way running from lightning, I don't know. But the point is, yes, you want cover, you want natural structure, take that to your advantage, but you also have to kind of allow that easy freedom of movement. Now, if I started moving faster in that kind of situation when it's a bit stressful, I'm probably gonna break a stick. There's a much higher chance of me falling down, blowing everything. Folks, I just wanna throw out a few thoughts just on camouflage. And I've just obviously demonstrated why I think that using structure in the environment is a more essential way of concealing yourself when you're hunting forests like I do. That's always worked for me because forests are my main hunting environment. I'm prioritizing sound and smell above direct sight of my person. There's no doubt that wearing some camouflage clothing is going to help. But one thing I notice a lot is that there's a lot of camouflage clothing out there that even if it's an effective pattern, people wear it more as a fashion accessory and that's not being critical, there's nothing wrong with fashion. So the face is such a recognizable feature and it's on the highest point of the body and it's most likely the first thing that an animal would ever see. So if you're not covering that, are you actually taking camouflage seriously? Second to that, the extremities that might move the most on the body, you're pasty like me, that just <laughs> sets off like a beacon. So it would make so much more sense to make sure that you've prioritized face coverage and hand coverage before you worried about the rest of the body. But hey, most hunting clothing comes in a camouflage pattern these days anyway. And of course, blaze orange, as we know, can't be seen by a deer, but if you see it with a, uh, a black breakup pattern on it um, to break up the outline, that's still contributing for sure. But none of that means anything unless you've got the most exposed features covered up and under control. So if, you're, if I've got the red stag of my dreams, cruising up here, up to within 30 metres, and he's having a sniff around, I've got my wind right. Even if he sees something moving around, he's going to give it a second thought. And you know, the difference between five seconds and the deer just having another look as I rack one in, and bang, you get what I'm saying. These are the small advantages that we've got to be taking, but as long as we're taking real advantages, one advantage that I haven't taken, which I ought to, I guess, is um, a stainless steel barrel sticking out, the possibility of it glinting, even just getting the very end of the barrel with some kind of camouflage tape would be a greater advantage than me wearing a shirt with a camouflage pattern. 
I started taking camouflage a lot more seriously when I got into bird hunting because in that range of priorities, you want the wind behind you when the birds are coming in. They're not sniffing you out, but they're looking. And so that why on that scale of priorities, the sight one is the top of the stack. Smell isn't even on the list. Sound, sure. If you're trumpeting away the wrong tunes and all that. You get what I'm saying though. If you've ended up getting your priorities wrong of advantages and you focus on all this other stuff like getting your camo ready but you haven't worked on the wind or you're clomping through really loud, you see what I'm saying. It's not worth taking certain advantages unless you've worked on that order of priority. <sighs> it's wet and I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to the car and get dry. What I'm just trying to get across is we're just trying to seize advantage wherever we can. And if you have that, if you're new to the game, just set yourself this mentality of it being like very high ambition every time you possibly can, but low expectation, and just knowing that the small things that you can do, the small techniques, that stuff that you can stack up yourself, which is developed over a period of time, is just is just it's like adding little extra black dots to a, a set of dice, and then sometimes adding extra dice to the mix and trying to roll as many sixes as you can. But we have a lot of control over that. It's not just chance. Anyway, folks, there's an assorted bunch of thoughts and factors for you to consider there. But um, if you are a fresh hunter and you've been struggling to close the distance, I really hope there might be one or two takeaways and all of that that will help you close that distance, help you get game in your freezer, all of that, keep your good times natural. But the main thing I really want you to take away is it's about building an instinct and you can really only do one thing at a time. So jump on that learning curve, expect it to take a bit of time and just enjoy being at bush. Happy days, folks. Till next time.